<laughs> there was a countdown. Yeah, sorry. That was uh, now we're live. Um, now we're live. Okay. Now we're live. Yeah. So let me just Good introduce time. you again. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, again, from Ajahn Sadar and Amaya's perspective. Um, yeah, this evening, uh, welcome to Wednesday evening with uh, the Clear Mountain Monastery community. Um, we're very happy to welcome Ajahn Sadar. Ajahn, thank you very much for your patience and for joining us this evening. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks again, Kova. And to reiterate again, <laughs> it's, uh, it's again, anybody that didn't see it last time, it's like, it's good to, it's good to touch base with you all again. It's good to sort of be in contact with you again. This is, it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's really nice when people invite you back somewhere because whenever somebody invites you back somewhere, it means that you're welcome and you have a home there. So I'm very, very grateful to be here. Wonderful. And, uh, just for people who might be joining for the first time, uh, usually what we do is we have a conversation for the first half hour or so, and then uh, we open things up to questions. So people are welcome to insert your questions in the comment section. Um, people are already starting to join there, which is great. And we'll roughly be uh, keeping the theme of sila or morality, ethics, self salvation and society. So, um, and maybe just start with uh, Ajahn, could you tell us a bit about why you were in uh, America recently on the East Coast? Yep, perfect. So, um, it, it's, I, was, I thought I'd start off by, by first, because I, I probably haven't had the opportunity to do this, and maybe some of you are in person. I was in America about two weeks ago, and actually, the Clear Mountain community came to my rescue and and helped me out with with some meals and travel and all these kinds of things. So I'm really really grateful for everybody that that helped me out while I while I actually was in America. Uh, that being said, yes, I, I was in America. I was in the East Coast. I was over in Boston. I was invited to a conference where they asked me to talk about um, talk about there's this theory, this psychological theory of adult development. The idea one matures more and more, gains greater perspective on the world. One starts to disentangle and disassociate from the ego that one has. Um, and so as you move through different stages, you become more and more detached from your ego to some extent. Uh, this was a this was a developmental theory that it was very popular in the 60s. It's, it's starting to get a, a bit of a resurgence now. So the conference was around that that actual uh, psychological theory. And what they asked me to talk about is maybe well, obviously, if somebody uh, matures and develops and has a better perspective on the world, then this is going to change the way that they morally relate to the world in some way. So they asked me to speak about some of the uh, maybe the moral aspects that you might see developmentally through change, through uh, loosening one's hold on one's own ego. And so that's essentially what I was talking about. And I get, so I gave a few different perspectives on the, on the moral psych, psychological uh, models of, of adult development. Uh, I gave some perspectives on the, uh, like neurodevelopment, how the brain actually changes uh, in association with moral development over a lifespan. Uh, I gave some perspectives on maybe some different ways that we, especially using neuroimaging techniques like fMRI. And then finally, I gave some perspectives on how Buddhist practice can actually be utilized in order to, in order to, uh, allow one to mature, uh, allow one to mature and to let go this sense of ego and this sense of self and specifically Buddhist practices aimed around, uh, the, the, the development of one's morality and reflection on one's morality. So these, uh, practices like, uh, like Silano Sati or the recollection of your own ethics or Chagano Sati, the recollection of generosity, um, how some of these practices, uh, above and beyond standard mindfulness or compassion can actually really be of great benefit to people. Mm. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, hear more about the 
Silani Sati, the recollection of morality, the recollection of generosity that you mentioned. But maybe before going into that, I'm curious, you're, it sounded like broadly speaking about different Western psychological models of development. And I'm curious if, uh, if and to what extent those overlap with your understanding and your experience of Buddhist frames of moral development? Like what is, what is, what is Buddhist moral development? And is it the exact same thing as uh, the Western psychological models or how do they, how might it differ if it does? Mm. Um, it's a really good question. And it's actually something I hadn't really thought about to tell you. <laughs> I went and did this conference and I didn't even really think about that. But so I guess we have to ask like, what is the conceptualization of Buddhist moral development over a lifespan? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's so clearly codified anywhere, anywhere in the suttas that there is this kind of developmental model that you would follow and, and that, that one would change with over time. I guess maybe the only thing that we could, or, or one thing we could think of is how, uh, through the path of practice, once one enters extreme entry, then, then at that point, it would be almost impossible for that individual to break, break the five precepts or something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really, and you can pr probably correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not really sure there is a model of moral development throughout a lifespan in Buddhism. And so they, that, that, that is very, and if that isn't, if we don't have those models, then that is really different from a lot of the uh, Western psychological models, which if we start to look from the kind of the cognitive, cognitivist revolution, the sixties, even starting with Piaget had this very kind of stage developmental model. You, uh, you reach different ages, you start to change morally, you take different perspectives on the world. Um, in the seventies, you had Kohlberg that was really throughout the lifespan, how we change, how we change morally. Some people get to different levels. Some don't. We look at, moral development from a Western perspective in psychology now, more along the lines of uh, uh, how maybe different aspects of our morality change over time. So, yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, it doesn't, it, I don't think it maps on well with the Buddhist conceptualization of moral development because I don't really know that there is a, a, a codified kind of theory of moral development in Buddhism. There obviously is a kind of moral development one uh, one uh, undertakes in the path, obviously you become more circumspect of your 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 thoughts, your speech, your actions. You become more refined in your understanding about your intentions towards other things and what that's doing towards the mind with increasing practice and increasing reflection. But that you know that doesn't really map on to the Western the Western kind of psychological concepts. Yeah, that that is interesting. Um, yeah, I definitely didn't ask it with any kind of answer in mind, but I thought you're pointing to stream entry, which mm. is basically this irreversible stage of mm. uh, basically you've gotten your sila, your morality under control. You're, you're what they call like sila sampano. You're accomplished in sila. You're no longer going to uh, break your, your precepts, whatever those are intentionally. And that's, uh, yeah, certainly a stage of moral development in, mm. in a Buddhist a framework, but it's something which I can't imagine, or it would be hard to imagine if such a kind of irreversible uh, yeah. stage, I mean, does that exist in, in Western frameworks at all? I don't think so. Um, there is this, there, like, let's say before maybe like the eighties, there was this kind of, yeah, you've hit this stage and you won't go back from that of moral development. So, and, the, and the, again, this is sort of, a lot of this is in terms of childhood development. So obviously you have a very different inference about the way that you're perceiving the minds of others when you're a child as compared to an adult. Maybe you won't go back, regress from that. But with more with westernized moral psychological models of moral development, there is this aspect of where you you maybe move, you move up, but then that doesn't mean that you're always at that level. You can sort of come back down you can maybe you know, have periods of your life where you're seeing things in a different perspective, but then you might start to regress. Even um, I think there's some even research showing that you know, people become, obviously, as you, the older you get, uh, you become more conservative.
anymore because it's within the Western models, you can go up and down a little bit, but within the, I guess, with the Buddhist models and something like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, path fruition and stream entry, there is, you know, there's no going back from that from the Buddhist perspective. Right. Um, I'm curious about maybe the, the other way around how um, we might be able to, or you might be able to suggest how some of these Western, these Western models, these different um, psychologists, psychiatrists were uh, creating these models and how that might be helpful for, you know, in, there is, there are stages in terms of um, the formalities of outward expression of uh, morality and ethics on the monastic level. I mean, yep. you, you, someone takes like eight precepts, trainee ordination and agarika. They stay that way for a year or so, depending on where they are. Then they do the novice ordination. That's 10 precepts. And then they jump up to the 227, you know, after a certain amount of time. Um, but that's doesn't necessarily have to correlate with an internal moral development. But I'm curious if you might be able to speak to how some of these frameworks might be framed for people who don't know about them. So Western Buddhist or people who might be watching mm. who aren't Buddhists, but who are interested in say, keeping the five precepts, keeping the eight precepts, or as monks, keeping all of the, the precepts of what is, uh, what models could we use to uh, visualize or think about conceive of our, our own development uh, on, on this path of morality? So do you mean, uh, do you mean, just, to, just so I understand your question properly, uh, do you mean how can we think about something like Buddhist morality in terms of following a set kind of virtue ethics, uh, a kind of virtue ethics, and how that could inform modern psychology or Western culture? Or was it, are you asking something else? Yeah, sorry. Probably more the, the other way around. So once someone comes to Buddhism, learns about these things called the yep. precepts, yep. and they say, oh, I've never heard about precepts before. Maybe they'd heard about commandments, but yep. they're like, I want to do this. Yep. What is in store for them? The average run-of-the-mill American, Australian, yep. who's wanting to bring precepts, bring morality into their life. What's, right. what's the path look like? Yeah. So I guess, you know, I, uh, and I'm, I'm sure most of us can attest to this is like, what does the path look like? It's, well, it's, 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 it's a lot of desire to go against it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of desire to go. So, oh, well, I, you know, I really, I really like doing these other things. So I, I'm constantly pulled back towards, towards the uh, old, old habitual ways of operating and operating in things that are maybe, maybe against, against the, the, the precepts in some kind of way. So I think we have to start to, at least if we're thinking of taking on the precepts, we have to start to see them as a, as a form of a different kind of habit pattern that we might have with our lives and as a form of, of enabling us to work with some kind of executive control and cognitive control and self-control in some kind of way where we have to, where we do have to regulate our thoughts, where we have to regulate our emotions and where we have to regulate our actions and where we have to regulate uh, uh, our, our, our relationship to our, our thoughts, emotions and behaviors. So I, there's, I think we should, somebody that's just coming into it is you, you really do have to, to have this perspective that, you know, it is going to be a challenge. Um, it's not going to be easy, um, but it's a form of building a different kind of habit and a different kind of relational perspective to the world. And that takes time and that takes practice, like, like building any habit. A little bit of a pause. Pretty sure he was going to say habit. Did I did I drop out just then? You dropped out mid mid habit. 
the word habit. Yeah. Habit. Okay, yeah. yeah. Habit. Like so habit. yeah, we need to develop a habit. Um, uh, developing a habit involves some kind of self-control, self-regulation. And so developing the precepts is the same thing. And I think the final point that I'll put on this is that um, I think one of the biggest resistances to following some kind of codified form of ethical framework is that we think it might be limiting us in some way. We might think that we might think that you know, these precepts are, uh, are prescriptive and that there's something that we have to do and that that, that means that there's, some, there's other things that we can't do anymore, so that's limitating to us. But I think there's this great, there is a great freedom in following these kinds, of, these kinds of precepts in some way in that it frees us up from so many things that we, we weren't even really realizing that we were sort of beholden patterns of the mind that just control us and pull us in different kinds of ways we don't realize that we're actually beholden to this and actually working with the precepts actually real makes us realize it's like well we're susceptible to being pulled around in the world like this and the 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 developing this habit of 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 uh, uh morally engaging in the precepts it actually frees us from that being just being dragged around in the world so there's a there's a great there is a great freedom in in uh, in keeping the keeping the precepts and, and thinking about the precepts in this way. Nice, that's a good sell. Yeah, you mentioned freedom in the same breath with morality and precepts, and <laughs> yeah, people might be less afraid of it. Um, yeah. I'm curious if you could go more into uh, that silanu silanu sati, this recollection of virtue and. Uh, your understanding of it, how your understanding of it has been uh, influenced by uh, the Western psychology research that you've done. And yep. if, if you have a practical way of teaching it to others. Um, cool. Yeah, I, it's, it's actually something I, I, really, uh, I, I really think is a very, very useful practice. And I think it's something that we, that we have to do as well as part of as a part of having a well-rounded practice. It's not just a, you know, we have this idea of if we look. Buddhist text said about it. There's this. There's a few suttas where he talks. Uh, he's talk, I think it's. I think it's the Mahanama Sutta or something like that, where he goes through these. I think they're called the six kind of inspirational uh, reflections. Uh, reflections on the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, uh, reflecting on morality, generosity, and reflecting on the goodness of the devas. Um, so this is a kind of. Uh, a reflective inspirational meditation and the way that the Buddha recommends us to do this is to think about the kind of moral standards that we might have and that we're keeping. This might be the five, eight, ten precepts and think and for us to reflect that this is this is something that's blameless. Living this way is blameless. This way is, is uh, uh, recommended by the wise. This way is... Um, this way is uh, something that actually leads to calm and leads to insight, uh, and reflecting on our on our standards and the thing and our, ac our speech and our actions and thinking, well, I'm actually doing really well here. My my morality is untorn. My morality is uh, unblemished. This is something that can really uplift the mind. And in in the Mahanama Sutra as well, the Buddha talks about how. If you're a householder and you're doing this, you know, you should do this when you're sitting, when you're standing, when you're walking, when you're lying down. You should uh, maintain this reflection when you're at work. Uh, you should maintain this reflection when you're at home in, in a busy lifestyle. So this is a kind of ref reflection that we can do on our morality, that uh, the moral standard that we're keeping, uh, and just reflecting and using it as a way to uplift us. But I think this has a dual purpose as well that's maybe not so so well defined in the in the in the suttas that it also enables us to face up where we might be limited in in our moral engagement in the world 
allows us to face up and go, actually, I'm not as, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I do lie a little bit a few times. Maybe I tell a white lie here and there. Maybe I wasn't so truthful with my, my partner or whatever it was. Maybe, maybe I'm not quite living up to this thing. So I think this reflection on morality, the Silan or Sati, it works as a way to both uplift us in some kind of way, but also a way to keep us in check and see where we actually might be falling back and where we where we could be improving. And I think if we do it in this manner of not this kind of not in a manner of 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 uh, self no bad, I'm not keeping up to my moral standards. But we do this in a way where like like a good friend would give us some advice of hey you've you know, like, there's these there's these there's aspects of your personality that you need to improve on. You know, if, if you have a wise and compassionate and kind friend, they'll be very encouraging to, uh, uh, towards you. And I think we, if we look at our morality in that kind of way, this is actually, this is the thing that really actually helps us improve on our morality quite a lot, as opposed to sort of, you know, uh, some sort of inquisition into our own morality. Nice. Yeah, I really like that uh, that list that comes up in the Mahanama Sutta and a lot of other places of yeah. one recollects their virtue as being untorn, unblemished, un, unspotted, all these different yeah. things. And then the last three are especially interesting. The one reflects that one's uh, precepts or one's morality, yeah. one's sila is liberating. Yeah. It's yeah. praised by the yeah. wise and it yeah. leads to concentration. Yeah. And uh, those three are especially good touchstones for judging the course of yeah how do i you know does my does my life do my choices that i made today do they uh were they liberating praise by the wise leading mm. to concentration mm. um after having kept all these uh these self-imposed rules or uh standards of integrity how do i feel at the end of the day am i ready to you know, sit down and, and feel peaceful. Um, but sometimes um, one might experience, especially maybe in a you know modern world where there's all sorts of interactions that people are having digitally or otherwise in the workplace that might not have happened so much in the Buddha's time, mm -hmm. um, where maybe one's not sure about how to keep these, these precepts. Like what is right speech um on the internet and i'm curious if if you have any advice for people about um what to do when there is moral ambiguity or when one is is not quite sure about the path to take they've got someone has decided i'm going to keep these five precepts eight mm -hmm. precepts ten precepts 227 precepts um but uh it just feels like it's not clicking. It doesn't feel liberating. It doesn't yeah. feel like necessarily every wise person is going to praise the way that I'm doing it. Mm. Um, so yeah, somewhat of a big and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. It's it's and it's it is good. Like the I, I think there's a lot of there is a lot of moral ambiguity in the world now. Um, what is you know what is right speech? You know you can look at something like if I, if I stand up for somebody. Uh, that I think is wrong, that might be considered a, a form of, uh, in, a, in a modern culture, that might be considered a form of uh, right speech or the right kind of action to do. Whereas maybe from a Buddhist perspective, this, this you know, might be seen as critical, uh, wrong, wrong speech in some kind of way. So what do we do with moral ambiguity? It's, you know, this is a perennial problem. Um, uh, the, the moral world is incredibly messy. And I think, you know, as you said, we have so many other avenues now where we're getting so much different input from the internet, social media, different forms of connection, uh, different roles that we have to take on in society now. Um, you know, the role of a of a worker, a parent, uh, uh, a community member. All we have so many different kinds of role now that might be might have been different to the to the time of the Buddha. And so there is a lot more. I think there's a lot more moral ambiguity. Um, so what the, the question is though, what do you do with moral ambiguity? I I I always think it's just as a rule of thumb, it's always better to 
lean into what you think would be the more morally appropriate response. Um, lean into what you think is the the good response in some kind of way. But then you know that there's going to be there's going to be ambiguity there, and that sometimes the the good response might not produce the good result. Sometimes you know sometimes maybe being honest uh, entails actually hurting someone. Maybe sometimes being um, uh, forthright is might be seen as being too confrontational in some kind of way. I think, though, if you learn to lean into what you think is good, then eventually you start to learn to develop the habit of, well, how do I actually do this more skillfully next time? So if the first time you're, you're honest and you tell the truth to somebody and it might hurt somebody, it's like, oh, okay, I told the truth, hurt this person, how do I do this better next time? Hmm. But you have still got that basis of I've told the truth instead of going, well, I'm just going to tell the white lie to, to appease this person. That's building a different kind of habit. So I think when there's moral ambiguity, lean into what you, into the truth, into honesty, into what you think is moral, what you think is right. And just know that you're going to make some mistakes in morally am ambiguous situations but the more you practice this and the more you develop this habit, then the better you get at this over time and you are able to act more morally in the world without even without harming other people through your moral stance. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great perspective. Um, as you're speaking, I'm just feeling like you're pointing to exactly how uh, moral attention really points to the relationship between how mindfulness can be a support for morality and how morality can be a support for for mindfulness how there's this kind of feedback loop there just yeah. paying attention to what you're doing and what the results are yeah yeah well uh thank you very much ajan gosh cool. time just speeds by yeah um, i don't think we got to any of the questions <laughs> <No>. <laughs> i think we have one we got to one um okay, okay. but we do have the questions from that as well, so i don't think we got to any of them but yeah we got some questions from uh, people here. We have another 15 minutes actually for questions from people here. So, oh, do we? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So here's Sorry, the first I one. Got the times mixed up. <laughs> yes. Um, yep. So it's 6.45. Uh, and yep. then you would definitely be more than welcome to join our Zoom room, yep. our Zoom sure. meeting if you're so inclined. Okay, great. Yep. Um, so the first question uh, is, nature and nurture has a lot to do with... Uh, has a lot to do with it in psych psychology. Yep. Since Western psychology doesn't talk about karma, the concept of karma, everything is tied to early childhood genetics and environment. Um, so I think that's, uh, let's see if there's a bit of a follow-up. Yeah. So following the precepts is like self-policing, which puts responsibility on individuals than on society. So there's a couple different um, thoughts there. Maybe this first one, um, yeah, what is what do you what do you think about this? What uh, is being pointed to of the Western psychological approach to just say relate everything to this this life and how you know almost to put the blame this uh, extrinsic yeah. uh, blaming of if you, if you can just figure out the right people to blame for the right things then yeah. um, then you'll know why uh, you're messed up. Um, yeah, I uh, and I I Vandana, yeah, I do agree. Like. Uh, Western psychology has historically been um, uh, predominated by nature and nurture um, uh, as an understanding, and maybe maybe not maybe not seen in, in the light of karma. But there is a you could say there's a bit of a move away from that now. In that you know we realize that nature and nurture are just as important as each other. But there's also but there's also like a biological basis for uh, uh, the way. Uh, like our brain chemistry, uh, it, this uh, the way that we're like physiologically made up. Uh, this is something that really influences how we morally engage in the world. And so there's this. I think there's this nice and, and like uh, you know, this is something I've been thinking about over the last few weeks, and I'm trying to formulate my thoughts about it. So I'm going to sort of speak and think in real time here, and hopefully something lands on it. I think there's this really nice 
overlap with what we think about as karma. If we think about karma and we think about it in the Buddhist perspective of, of happening over multiple lives and multiple existences and all these things and all these massive amounts of causes and conditions that we have as our own karma, um, there's something really nice with if you can sort of tie that to our, uh, to our evolutionary makeup in some kind of way in that you know there was you know there's there's not only what happened to you like one second ago that determines your behavior in the in the current moment there's there's what happened to you like five minutes ago there's what happened to you this morning there's what happened to you when you were a child there's what happened to you from the particular kind of uh parents that you have uh the particular kind of culture that you were brought up in the the particular you know your 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 uh, epigenetics throughout like throughout time and throughout your uh, evolution, whole evolutionary makeup, all these different, you know, all the way back to, all the way back to, you know, the big bang kind of thing, all these different things happen to produce action that you did right now. There's massive amounts of causes and conditions that are a part of that, that have got to there, got to you actually doing this thing right now. And you couldn't have done any, anything any other way because this is the kind of person you are now and this is the so i i'm trying to see this as a as a form of karma in some kind of way this whole this whole process so i'm not sure again i'm trying to i'm just sort of trying to formulate these thoughts i'm not really sure if it's making any sense i'm not really sure if it answers the question in some kind of way it's just a little tangent that i went off on so <laughs> yeah i think it's uh i think it's a good point yeah that things are a lot more complicated than just uh, the present moment for sure, mm. or the present life and our, the mm. relationships that we know about. Mm. Um, and I don't think I'll pursue more that line of reasoning that uh, we might not be able, that we can't do anything else in the present moment. Uh, unless, so, please. <laughs> so the reason I went on that rant is the point I was trying to get at is that, okay, so modern psychology doesn't really talk about things in terms of karma. But if you think of karma in this kind of long-term biological way, then you can maybe see how this, uh, uh, the nature and the nurture kind of thing that actually does relate in some way to what we think of as karma. So that's, that's the point I was getting at, but I just, I took myself off course. <laughs> that's, that's actually really interesting. And I think, uh, certainly in terms of the, the term karma is used in so many different, uh, contexts mm -hmm. in, I mean, even within Buddhism, not to mention, uh, Vedic texts or the Upanishads or, mm -hmm. I believe Jain texts as well, this karma, kama, just yeah. meaning action and yeah. basically just pointing to cause and effect. And yeah, yeah you bringing evolution and human biology and um, yes, yeah, species uh, evolution, you know, it's, it's all, it's all action. It's all um, causes and effects. So it's an interesting, interesting angle on things. Um, another question. Uh, it's difficult today on the internet. If you don't lie, you are admonished. A lynch mob appears and you are abused. If you lie, you are praised. It's really scary. So what do you think, Ajahn, about this? Almost the reverse incentives, these negative incentives to, to do things on the internet, which are uh, counter to not just Buddhist morality, but yeah, yeah, yeah. many systems of morality. I... Who asked the question? Fingerprint. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I, I see your point, uh, and uh, I, I know that in some way that there is a there is a bit of a push in society, and there is a bit of a push on the internet to to act in that way. But I also think that there's correlations with the internet and the real world. You know, this, these kinds of things happen in the real world as well. Sometimes it's easier to lie to get ahead in your job or something or, or to get ahead in a relationship or you lie, to, you lie in your resume to get a job or something like that. Um, and, you know, honesty is, you know, if, you, you, if you're honest on your resume, it's like you might not get the job. So you're encouraged to lie. So I think there, there's obviously there's parallels to the internet world and the, and the real world as well. And, and I think the same rules do apply in some kind of way in that we have to learn how to, how to 
not lie and we have to learn how to tell the truth and do this in the most effective manner. And in the longer term, maybe in the short term, you might take some hits for it. But in the longer term, there's definitely much more of a benefit of not lying and, and telling the truth. Um, so while the internet sort of, you could say the internet in a way piles on in the short term, like in the long term, does I don't think it, it, it doesn't matter as much. So I think honesty in every, in every medium uh, is, is a better policy and truth telling is a better policy because eventually truth does come out. If it's, if it's something that's true and you know that it's true and you're being honest, you don't change that story that you've got no need to actually change the story and to change the parameters of what that thing is. But if you lie, you know, a lie will always continue to change because it's a, it's a misrepre misrepresentation of reality in some way. So I think while it's hard, I think sticking with telling the truth is much, much better. And eventually you'll just get better at it over time a bit, uh, with your ability to actually do it. And yeah, you, you, you're okay. You're okay if somebody criticizes you for, for telling the truth and not lying. It's like, well, it's, that's more, me telling the truth is more important, uh, more important to me and my own sense of self-worth than is somebody else's opinion about what I've said. Yeah, here's a question which uh, uh, maybe test that or test the nuances of that, that general principle to just, yeah, always or pretty much leaning in the direction of, of the truth all the time. Yep. The question is, uh, at work this week, I told the truth when someone asked how I'm doing and yep. said, I'm all right. When the right answer, in quotes, scare quotes, would have been, I'm good yep. or I'm great. And then continued. So while I could not bring myself to give the quote right answer, I see that my truthful answer might make me seem insufficiently op optimistic. What do you think mm. about that? John? Yeah, it's so, you know, so I don't think there's anything wrong with being, you know, insurmountably optimistic or whatever the quote actually was. It's probably, probably a good thing to, probably a good thing to be. Uh, just to start off as a first, yeah, insufficiently optimistic. Um, I, I, being sufficiently optimistic, I think is a great thing to be. So, you know, be sufficiently optimistic and say that you're great. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, now, now with, uh, you know, with telling the, you know, with actually giving people a truthful answer, this doesn't mean you just blurt out everything that's in your mind. You know, you can, you know, you can be, guarded about some things so so say for example if somebody asks you uh, how are you today and if you're uh you know you might be having a lot of problems at home you might be uh you might be going through some kind of financial hardship or something like that you know you don't say to this person i'm going through so much financial hardship at the moment my you know my wife's gonna leave me you don't need to tell that truth <laughs> you don't need to tell that truth to that person in that instance so, you know, there's, there's, once we start to learn to tell the truth more, we can, we can still answer people. Except, um, but we don't have to give them, we don't have to give them absolutely everything that's just in the, like in the storehouses of our mind. So I think, you know, saying something like if somebody asks you, how are you going? And if you're, if you're doing really bad, you know, you can answer in a way of saying something like, oh, you know, things and things are not so great at the moment, but you know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm getting through the day and that's enough. Like you don't have to tell them about the financial hardships and the wife that's about to leave you. It's still the truth, but you know, maybe it's not the, 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 you know, the, the full painted in red version of the truth. Hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. John. Um, got time for one or two or three more questions. Let's see. Uh, do you see, Ajahn, that perhaps the Dhamma approach of gradual training mm -hmm. is a developmental approach, uh, yet the key aspect being that this occurs over multiple lives usually? Uh, do you have a perspective on that, Ajahn? Yeah, it, so, and so as part of this, this uh, 
this conference that I was at, that actually that was that was one of the points I ended up making is that uh, the the Buddhist path of practice is a gradual path of training, and we're actually like training to, you know, move towards part of you know the, the goal of Buddhist training is to gradually train oneself to dislodge from the sense of self. Uh, this particular model of of moral, uh, sorry, of of maturity development that the psychological development they're talking about. This is a form of gradual development to you know, disentangle oneself from the ego. But, but the question is the the Buddhist teaching, uh, the the gradual teaching, is this a way to look at it as a form of developmental uh, a, a developmental theory? Yeah, I, in some way, I, I guess it, I guess it would be um, that we are. Over the course of our of our lifespan, from from the time we take up the Buddhist teachings, and with time we start to practice the Buddhist teachings, and throughout the rest of our lives that we're practicing this, this is uh, performing a developmental function in some way, and hopefully it's developing us towards uh, things that are kusala, things that are wholesome, things that are that are that are. Uh, seen in terms of punya, they're seen in terms of things that are, are, are good. So I think that it is, the gradual training is a kind of developmental model. Um, how it occurs over lifespans, I, you know, you can definitely, I think you could, you could make that argument in some kind of way. Um, it's, it's a bit harder to track it, track it on over different courses of lives because lives might be, uh, uh, you, you might take on different forms in different lives, so you might come back next life as a fish. So, so as it's hard to say whether you're how much you're developing as a fish. So, I, yeah, but I could I could see the I can see the rationale that it is a gradual development over lives as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, John, thank you so much. Um, we've got a few more interesting questions, but. Um, I would hope I'm going to put the link for the Zoom room here and uh, would love it if people who've uh, put questions here, if you could uh, copy and paste them and just come over to uh, this Zoom room here. And I think Ajahn Sadaro, you'll be there? Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Wonderful. And uh, we'll just go over there for a more interactive discussion. And this Saturday, Ajahn Nisabo, uh, he's still got two or three more weeks of retreat, but he always has been coming out on the Saturdays. So you can see him there in person. And we'll be back again next week for another Wednesday evening. Actually, I think next week it'll be Ajahn Nisabo and I in conversation. So hope everyone has a good evening. And everybody who can should join us over at the Zoom room. And Ajahn Sadaro, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, no problem. Again, great to connect. Great to see everybody uh, person soon. All right. Night, everybody.